I'm Richard Stanford. I work with the Authors Live and Rajabian uh, Speaker Series. Uh, and today we have Susan Robb, the Senior Associate Pastor of Highland Park United Methodist Church, uh, with her second book, uh, Seven Words. And uh, her first book, Called, uh, was published by Abington, was a popular, popular uh, book with Abington. And now her second one is perfect for the Lenten season. Uh, called it's the words of Christ from the cross. Uh, these books are all available locally from Interabang Bookstore on Lover's Lane, uh, from Logos Bookstore in Snyder Plaza, available from Cokesbury Publishing House, and uh, from Amazon. Why is it important to reflect on the last words of Christ from the cross? And in asking this, I'm also asking, uh, why'd you write this book? Yeah. yeah. Gosh, that's a, that's a big question. It's a great question. Um, you know, as we come into Lent, I don't know about you, but like growing up, I grew up in a, a faithful family, but we didn't often go to church. And so we tended to um, go from like uh, Christmas and Easter or Christmas and then Palm Sunday where we're waving palm branches to Easter. We went from joy to joy to joy. And even as a young adult, I really didn't want to get too close to the cross. I didn't want to, to delve into Jesus's suffering. And what I've discovered as a minister is that it's important, especially in this season of Lent, that we draw near to the cross and we listen to the last seven words that Jesus, is, uh, that Jesus utters. And as we all know, it's not really just seven words, it's seven sayings that Jesus has to say. And why I think this is important and this is why I wrote the book. As a minister, uh, and I know you've experienced this with friends, but as a minister, I often say I have the holy privilege of being at the bedside of those who are near death or those who are in the hospital who aren't really sure what the outcome of a surgery might be. And so they, they might die. And what I've discovered in those moments is that when people are dying, or they think they might be dying, that they want those they love to come near and the last words that they speak to them are the most important ones that they want those they love to hear. And what I also discover is that those who are gathered around them want to lean in and listen in hopes that they'll hear something that's just for them. And they always do. And those words are typically uh, words that, that convey in some respect, I love you more than you will ever know. And the same is true for Jesus. In his last seven words on the cross, Jesus conveys in death what he lived his life trying to convey to people, the magnitude of God's love for them. Um, also, when people are dying, you know, they, they convey these wonderful messages, and they're often messages of um, encouragement, mer uh, sometimes messages of instruction, uh, like, I want you to take care of each other messages um, of, of hope, everything's going to be okay. And so the same is true for Jesus. He offers us a lot of depth from his words on the cross. And so I think it's important for us to draw near and listen. And what we also find is that in those words, Jesus, um, e even though, again, some of us are sort of afraid to go there, these words, if you, if you, if you follow them to their biblical conclusion, are words of of hope and strength and joy and victory. And so really, um, it's, a, it's a delight and a holy privilege to sit at the foot of the cross with Jesus during Lent. And so I hope everyone will want to do that with me. Fabulous. I, yeah. uh, now, it's been my experience that authors start out writing a book and they learn so much more than they thought they were gonna learn. Is there anything you've really learned from writing this book? Oh my, I've learned so much in writing the book. Um, you know, I did a lot of research, a lot of biblical research, a lot of historical research, and you always come away with more, uh, I, I think as an author, than those who will be reading the book. But I came away with a lot spiritually, but also um, I'd say intellectually. Um, so one of the things that I found most interesting that I never knew before I started research on this book is that there's a lot of controversy around Jesus's words that say 
um, where Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And what I discovered is that the oldest manuscripts that we have uh, of the New Testament in those manuscripts from the same era, some manuscripts have the verse, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And in some of them, it's missing. So the question is, as scribes were, were writing, did someone add in that verse or did someone remove the verse? And there are a lot of theories around that. I tend to be one, as I, look, as I read all the research, to lean toward this omission. I think that uh, during the time that these scribes were copying the New Testament, that it was offensive for some of them to leave those words in because Christians were still being horribly persecuted. And I think they thought, how could, how could God forgive the killing of our Messiah and how could God forgive people who are still persecuting us as Christians? Um, and But what I think the evidence to say that I think that those truly are Jesus' words is because if you, if you find later in Acts, of course Luke wrote Luke and Acts, um, Stephen is stoned and he says some of the same words that Jesus does, please forgive them. So I think that the, the Gospels just play out that this is the kind of person Jesus was, that that he was praying for God to forgive those who persecuted him. How interesting. Yeah, I, so I, I, that was something I learned. Well, the, yeah. the, the, the seven last words can be so deep and so confusing to people sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Context is so important. Yeah. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, yeah. I know you can only scratch the surface yeah. with any answer to... Uh, how you address that in this book. You know, I'm glad you asked that question about, so what does that mean? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I, and I have to tell you that those are probably some of the words that uh, I find m most confusing, the ones that I really wanted to shy away from. But I learned so much in the research of this and in, and in living through some of these. So as Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, he's on the cross. He has been beaten and scourged and spit upon and ridiculed. And I think these words, one, show the depth of Jesus' humanity. Jesus in that moment feels everything that we have ever felt. And let's face it, in our, in our lives, all of us at some point in our lives have felt God forsaken. And so I think, one, this shows Jesus' humanity, but I, that makes us question, was Jesus forsaken by God? Did Jesus really think that he had been forsaken by his Father? And the answer to that is no. Uh, what I think is so incredible is when the, G, the, the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every good Jewish person in Jesus' day would know that that is the opening to Psalm 22. It's a psalm or a song that... They would have all sung in synagogue. They would have sung at home with their parents. It's, it would be as if um, us singing church songs, for instance, because I want to I ask you this, Richard. If I start a song, I bet you know the next verse okay. or the line. So, for instance, if I were to say, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. <laughs> it, well, yeah. Uh, what if I said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Exactly. We know those songs because they've been ingrained in us since childhood in the church. The same is true for Jesus. And if Jesus, you know, Jesus on the cross doesn't have the energy to say more. He's basically suffocating on the cross. But if he had had the energy to keep singing, my guess is that those around him would have, might have joined in. And here, here's what, we would have heard. Um, we would have heard, because here's what I know. Jesus feels forsaken by God on the cross, but he knows deep down that he isn't, because Jesus knows the rest of the words. So I want to share some of the rest of the words to the psalm. So if Jesus had continued, the crowd uh, might have joined in and said, in your ancestors, in our ancestors, we tr we, you trusted. They trusted you, 
and you delivered them, speaking of God. To you they cried and were saved, and in you they trusted and were not put to shame. Jesus knows that God heard the cries of those in Egypt who were enslaved in Egypt in the wilderness and delivered them from slavery. Jesus knows that God heard the cries of the Hebrews in the wilderness when they were thirsty and hungry and God provided for them. Jesus knows that God heard the cries of those who were exiled in Babylon and like a nursing mother brought comfort to God's children. So Jesus knows that those are the next words of the psalm. And Jesus doesn't have to quote the rest of the psalm because he knows his followers will understand the reference and they know the end of the psalm too. And this is how the psalm ends. To him, meaning God, to him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust and I shall live for him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. That would be us, Richard, saying he has done it. This psalm, Jesus' last words from the cross, it's not a song about being forsaken. It's a song of victory. And what I think this shows is that Jesus is human. He feels forsaken like we all do, and yet he knows that he knows that he knows that he is not forsaken and that God will triumph. This is a song of triumph and trust. Amazing. I, uh, these can be so confusing. Context is so important. That's what yeah. I love about this book. Yeah. You get the Thank context you. of all Thank these you. things. Uh, well, let me try one more. Uh, that, I mean, can we give away the whole book now? No, <laughs> no, we can't. But but I will. But uh, a third word, um, mm -hmm. um, a woman. This is your son. Mm. That would seem obvious, but you know, there's more. Yeah, woman. This is your son, and of course, then he says, turns to the beloved disciple and says, "This is your mother." Well, you know what I love about John's gospel, and I know you do too, is it in John's gospel there's a surface meaning. And then there's a deeper symbolic meaning to everything that Jesus says and does. And so as he is hanging on the cross, he looks down in this great compassion, sees his mother who is just heartbroken and bereft. And he also is concerned about her future. And so he looks down at her and says, woman, and then pointing, or not pointing because he can't, but then turning and looking at the man standing next to her, the beloved disciple says, woman, this is your son, and this is your mother. What I find interesting is that, of course, Jesus had other brothers who could have taken care right. of his mother, who would have been expected to take care of his mother after his death. Right. But this, on, on the surface level, it's I want to make sure, just like when we're at the bedside of those who say, y'all take care of each other. Jesus wants to make sure that his mother is cared for, but there's a deeper meaning. This is a moment in the gospel, like in the in the in the letter, in Acts, the church is begun when the Holy Spirit comes down upon all those gathered at Pentecost. There isn't that story is not in John. In John's gospel, the church begins when Jesus declares from the cross. He creates a new family. Woman, here's your son. Son, here's your mother. You take care of each other, and that is what we are to do as a church. We are now family and we care for one another. We are left in each other's care by Jesus. So that's, that's what I see in that. It's the beginning of the church. Well, that's a lot. And, and, and yeah. there's so much in this. That's what I love about the, the context and the understanding because we do get so confused and this really yeah. helps a lot of us. It certainly has helped me reading this book. Uh, I like your stories. You tell stories that are... Um, uh, about, about individuals we know, but you also tell some personal stories, yeah. and and uh, uh, perhaps the story of you and your brother Mike is is maybe one of the most touching of the personal stories. Uh, Thank you for for sharing that because, uh, like I said, um, some of these stories do come from actual bedside death stories, and. Um, um, I had a, a brother who died really just about a year before this book was published. And so all of that was still very 
fresh in my mind. And this came up in the, um, the last words where Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And what I found in my brother, um, I remember one day, my brother had been battling with uh, cancer for 13 years. He'd li living with it well, had a great quality of life. But then um, I was out of town and I got a call from my sister-in-law and I knew that she wouldn't have called me if something wasn't serious. And so um, I realized, she, I mean, she says, Mike's at MD Anderson, you need to come, it doesn't look good. And so I got in my car and I kept thinking, I am, I just, I'm thirsty to like hear his voice one more time and to tell him I love him. And what I got, I got to go back and tell you a little bit, my brother, you've probably met him so you would know that he had this effervescent personality that just, it was, it was almost like if you opened a champagne bottle with too much force and it just, his personality just came bubbling out and people were drawn to him and they would come, anyone who would come close enough to like gather everything that was pouring over from him, um, he was just bubbly and effervescent. And so that was his personality. And, and I kept thinking, I'm just thirsty for one more sip of what he has to offer. And um, so I, when he was dying, I, I went to MD Anderson. I got there and he was pretty unresponsive. And I remember staying by his bed um, one afternoon while everyone else went to lunch and no one expected him to really kind of wake up again but I leaned over and I was just saying you know I Mike I love you so much and just I just need to know that and his his eyes flew open and he just grabbed me by the neck and pulled my face down close to his and he said I love you and then he kissed me on the cheek and then he was back out again and so those were the last words that he spoke to me and really aren't those those are the words that we all that we're all thirsty to hear we all want to know we're all thirsty to know that we are loved and accepted and that's really the most important thing in life and quite honestly the same is true for Jesus people flocked around him because this love and care just overflowed from him and everyone gathered around to catch what they could from him. And when he's on the cross, I don't want to give away everything, but again, this is John's gospel. When he's on the cross and he says, I'm thirsty, on the surface level, it's that this man is truly human. He's suffering like we are. He's lost blood. He's in the searing heat. He's thirsty. But on the symbolic level, this is as the John's gospel describes him, is the living water. You know, the woman comes to him at the well and he says, and gives him a drink. And he said, if you had asked me for a drink, I would have given you living water and you would never be thirsty again. And she goes, where can I get some of this stuff? You know, um, Jesus says too, that those who are thirsty should come to him and he will offer them living water. And so the one who is living water on the cross has poured out himself completely for all of humanity. And in that moment, he is thirsty because he has totally depleted himself for the world. But he also says in John's gospel, he also says, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water, which means as his followers, we have drunk deeply from Jesus. We are carriers of that living water. And what that means is we have a thirsty world who's thirsty to know how deeply they are loved and how deeply they are loved by God. And we too are to be um, con conveyors of that living water, to offer that living water to others. So that is I'm thirsty. But there's a whole lot more, there's a whole lot more to I'm thirsty. Oh. You've got to. You've well, got and to that's read the it. and that's the problem. I've I've yeah. read the book, and, yeah. and there is so much depth to each of the last words that uh, that that you cover wonderfully. But yeah. but we can't cover it in a in a short yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, now, one thing I would like to talk about is something that just fascinated me in one of your chapters. You talked about thin places, and that really oh. spoke to me. Yeah. 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 Well, a thin place is where it it appears that sort of there is. There's, there's no distinction between heaven and earth. Heaven and earth have sort of met. And um, f for instance, there's a place off the coast of Iona 
Uh, it's an island uh, off of Scotland, a place off the coast of Scotland, uh, uh, an island called Iona. And it is considered to be a thin place. There's a monastery there. People come and do pilgrimages from all over the world. And it's, it has been said that um, people who have really had no spirituality at all before have come there and had these great spiritual experiences. They experience a thin place where it seems that heaven and earth are meet in that spot. Um, I think at, at the cross, um, where Jesus says, he's, uh, his last words are, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And in that moment, those who are attuned and who are listening will experience a thin place. And actually, Luke writes, in, after Jesus says, into your hands I commend my spirit, that the veil in the temple splits in two. Now in the temple, the high priest would go into the place called the Holy of Holies. He'd go behind this veil, behind this thick curtain, and make sacrifices once a year to God for the sins of the people. And so only then, once a year, would the high priest be able to go in behind the veil and make um, confession for all the people, and he would basically take the people into God's presence symbolically. Well, when Jesus dies and says, into your hands I commend my spirit, the veil is torn in two, which is symbolic that we now have complete access to God's presence and God's love. We don't need an intermediary. And so in those words, there is this, this thin place where heaven and earth meet um, in, in Jesus' words and for us. Yeah. Well, and, and the reason I ask that question, mm -hmm. I have experienced thin places. I think we've all experienced yeah. thin places, and so that really speaks to, yeah. to so me. Where do, you, where do you experience your thin places, Richard? Uh, in, in, in amazing places every once yeah. in a while, and at amazing times that, yeah. that you didn't, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, yeah. And sometimes it's in the rearview mirror. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's almost like the Road to Emmaus experience. It's a, and then I knew that somehow I'd been in the presence of Jesus. But the, yeah. the thin place is just, uh, it's, it's a fascinating yeah. study in your book about the yeah. thin place. So it's like, Jake, in, there's another thin place in the Bible where, you know, Jacob is, yeah. is, goes to sleep. He's yes. fleeing his brother. He goes to sleep. He lays his head on a rock in the desert. And he has this dream of angels coming and going, like on an elevator, escalator yeah. from yeah. heaven. And he wakes up and he says, God was in this place, and I didn't even know it. Know it. Yeah. That's right, and that's yeah. that's been my experience. Yeah, it, yeah me too. Um, now, um, this book, as I've said, devotionally wonderful, a call to personal action, wonderful context and understandings of things that are, are deep, and that's what I liked about this book, but you're the author. Yeah. And so uh, what I'd like to ask you is what would you like your readers to take away from this book? Well, one, I, I, I hope that they will engage in the seven words during Lent. So I think, one, I hope that everyone realizes the importance of drawing near the cross at Lent. But once they do, the, those who will engage, the, for those who aren't afraid to draw near and lean in and listen, I hope, because I really think that they will experience the magnitude of this unfathomable love that God has for each and every person. And I think that they will come away experiencing this awe and they will come away experiencing um, joy and victory like Jesus like Jesus uh, hopes for us to carry. I, I, th I hope that, that by experiencing these seven words that, that they will deepen each reader's understanding of and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's that's the main thing. Yeah. And that's the important that's thing. The important so that's the important thing. That's, um, yeah. Well, as we said before, um, this is this book is available now uh, in Terabang Bookstore on Lover's Lane, uh, Logos Bookstore in Snyder Plaza, uh, Cokesbury, Amazon, uh, Now's the time to really engage with this book. This is the Lenten season. And I'm going to volunteer Susan, if, if she'll volunteer herself. Yeah. I'm, uh, 
uh, for those of you in the Dallas area, uh, Susan Robb is, uh, I think, available to, to speak about her I, book. Yeah, de depends yeah. on timing. Sure, yeah, that's right. sure, and I can so, do that. And I, actually, I've done some Zoom calls with people in other states as well. And okay. so, you know, if you need to reach out, if you're interested in, in uh, me Zooming in with you, you can reach me at robs at hpumc.org. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. This is such a timely book, and it and and. Uh, as, as one who's read it, uh, truly meaningful. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm.